of our uh, teachings, but uh, I'm going to hand over to Prasad to introduce today's speaker. But I just wanted to read the message which has been sent by Professor Noam Chomsky. Uh, to directly and it's very short I'll just read this statement of his many or rather I should say his question many of us remain very concerned about the crisis in JNU which was apparently created and precipitated by the government and university administration with no credible evidence of any seditious activities on campus why did you allow the police on campus when it is clear that this was not legally required Thank you, ma'am. Professor GJV Prasad, please introduce today's class. Thank you. International Mother Language Day. Namaste. Manakam. Namaskaram. Good evening. Salam. <laughs> you know, uh, this is the place to talk about diversity, this is the place to talk about nationalism and who better than Aisha Kidwai. I have known Aisha Kidwai for a very long time. I have known Aisha as a very young student. She was a young student, not me. <laughs> <laughs> And Aisha was always, always, always this bright, this sharp, and with a great sense of humor. A great friend to friends. And you might take her a lot, but you won't know it. So Aisha, uh, you know, has, has many, many aspects to her. The latest aspect, I shouldn't say the latest, one of the new aspects to her is as a translator. Uh, recent aspects. And you know she's translated in Freedom Shade, so she's got a book on therefore and partition, and she actually puts herself in the midst in her family history, a history that struggled for the nation. A history where they chose chose India and chose to fight in spite of personal tragedies, tragedies that which were brought about by partition. To teach, to tell us, to teach us and to call us anti-nationalists to tell us that oh, what nationalism is, to teach us nationalism, is so idiotic. <laughs> it's pathetic. So, I'm so glad that Aisha is here to speak today. And on, as I said, International Mother, Mother Language Day, uh, it's interesting, the, in the, the difference between tongue and language, which of course she'll work on, um, talk, talk to us about, because her talk is language or mother tongue, right? Uh, yeah, the constitution and linguistic diversity. So, who better than Raisha and why am I standing in the way? Friends, today is International Mother Language Day. Uh, this day, which was adopted by the UN, first mentioned in 1999, and uh, formally adopted as a day to be celebrated across the world from 2008. This year's theme is the importance of mother tongue education. In a university campus which is facing sustained attack and great travails and great resistance, it is important for us to remember why, or even to understand if you don't know it, to remember why this day and why this particular month. This has to do with, um, uh, the story has to do with neighbors of ours, uh, Bangladesh, when it was East Pakistan. In March, I think 1950, uh, this, uh, the, the West Pakistan Parliament decided to impose Urdu upon East Pakistan, which is now Bangladesh. On this day, for the next two years, there was a uh, huge agitation building up. Opposition uh, kept on growing. 
And on this day, on the 21st of February, which is known in Bangladesh and in West Bengal as Akushi, the 21st, on Akushi, there was in Dhaka University a call for a demonstration. And just as we saw in the uh, days just past, people started pouring in. And the demand was, we want to honor our mother tongue. We will speak only in our mother tongue. The Vice Chancellor, who is better Vice Chancellor than us, <laughs> rushed down senior professors and junior professors and badly behaved professors all rushed down, tried, and there was a big clash. Police firing happened, five students were killed. And from that day began the Bangladeshi resistance. This story has been told today again by Ashish Tata in the Hindu. And he said that, why, I mean, what relevance does it have? Well, of course, we're standing in a local where actually talking about the rights of people over the rights of nation, national governments is very important. But it is also to honor our mother tongues and the marginalized. Turning to India, around the same time, just the two years before that, the Indian government and the constitution of India was adopted. And in our constitution, there was great importance given to the mother tongue. Article 30, Article 350A gave right to the instruction in the mother tongue. Protection of uh, the rights of linguistic minorities, the rights to uh, speak your mother tongue in the Indian parliament and in the Indian legislature are all mentioned in the constitution. How many mother tongues are there in India? How many of you know? How many languages are there in India? How many dialects are there in India? Yes. These are questions which, you know, if you say 700, then you're very well informed because actually the Indian state does not know. It does not know how many mother tongues are spoken in this country. It doesn't. It certainly determines what languages are. And of course, dialects have no mention. India is a country that has lived in this linguistic ignorance. For what reason? First, let me tell you the facts. As we know them, because the last time the government mentioned them was in 1962, where it actually listed what were the mother tongues in our country. And it's at 1652. Now imagine a state which has to deal with the fact that this constitution, this pesky constitution of ours, has said that you, every citizen has the right to education in their mother tongue. 1,652 languages. I forget about the five. So from the 1971 census onward, our country, our nation, if you want right to call it, has been losing pluralism and the recognition of people and their rights to their culture and language at a steady rate. The census enumerator still asks the questions about language. So they go out and they ask people what you speak. Linguists have always made sure that you please don't tell them what they speak, you ask them. And the people of India in the 1991 census gave 6,000 language names. In the 2001 census, because you know, they get ill mange more always, so they gave 10,441 names. And the Indian government decided that there are some mother tongues, but they are definitely languages with a capital L. And that language with a capital L number from those, remember those 10,414 names that you the Indians returned, there were 112 languages in uppercase. And when they returned 6,444 names, or 40 names, then there were 114 languages. So how does the state come up with this? How does the census of India come up with these figures? It does these figures by actually doing something that all censuses will pass through, because language is often not named by itself. It is named by others. So you will get, you know, in those census answers, you will get things like, what language do you speak? I speak Mochi. What do you speak? I speak, um, you know, the name of the region that you come from. And of course it has to rationalize it. 
and to pair them down and to group them. When it groups them, it uses three strategies. All three strategies are actually insulting to the people of India. The first strategy is one that says, okay, if you have below 10,000 speakers, you're not to be counted. Now the Adivasis and the small community, smaller communities, I have students in JNU whose family, uh, his village just speaks that language. And it's 800 or 1200. So this is one way to deny us the promise of our constitution, to write those languages out. They will never be taught, they will never be, they will be spoken with shame, they will have no grammars, these are people who will feel that they don't have any self-worth. They can't even learn an A, B, C, a Varnamala in a language. So, so there are lots of languages below 10,000 speakers. From what I know, it's about over a thousand such languages and they are, they are active. Then they say, okay, so I still have lots of, so let's say with the figure of 10,000, I've only managed to ask about 1,000. So let me do some little more trickery. Let's make sure that uh, the languages I know which belong to a certain family, let me make smaller classifications of them. This has unfortunately led to the terrible, terrible belief that Hindi is a national language. In fact, Hindi is, there is no national language of India. There are only official languages and associate official languages, Hindi. This eighth schedule of our constitution lists just 22 languages and because it was written at the right time, there's no capital L. It just says languages, all in uppercase. There's of course a tussle to get into that eighth schedule, which is you know, some strike it lucky, some don't. So in that group, so what the census of India does is take the language names and then put together them under one language. So some dialects get put in, some, uh, you know, all fully autonomous languages get put into that bunch. Hindi from the last census, or 2001, which we have data for, is 50 distinct languages that are put into the basket of Hindi. So yeah, sure everybody speaks Hindi, but not the one that, uh, you know, Durdashan used to use, and not the one which is not a language which shows continuity across people. Not only that, the government also says that or the strategy that I also employed is to look at languages as um, whether they have many of the times, it's whether languages have a written script. In a matter of a great shame for this Indian nation, not every language in India has a script. I think that, you know, there are many places where we might feel better off than the Soviet Union, but I think this is one place that, that we are not. Because in the Soviet Union, which had thousands of languages, every language was given a script by 1925. And we are here in 2015, and there is no way to write many, many languages in India. Why this tension? Why this tension, this artificial categories of languages with an uppercase L, is a betrayal of our constitution. And of course, as you know, the world moves further into this, actually hurt, hurtles headlong into this path of, you know, criminalized development, and more and more people have to go and leave their homes, leave their land, lose their languages. There is a lot of concern that people have about what, is, what happens when a language is endangered. And we are given all kinds of utilitarian understandings that, oh, no, no, we must preserve languages. We must make sure, because these are the people who have the knowledge of their culture. They know the lay of the land. They know the flora and the flora. While this is good, if this knowledge rests with the community, we've seen in many cultures, and increasingly so we shall see, that just thinking of a utilitarian need, to say that, oh, they're really important for quote-unquote indigenous knowledge systems is not enough because the knowledge does not stay with that community. Rather, I think that as linguists, and you know, we all write good letters, Noam wrote a good one today, uh, as, linguists, as linguists, as people, as citizens of this country, we should think of what does it mean to have a language in terms of the area of knowledge. Linguists, the kind of linguistics I do, and many students in our centre do, there is a way, I mean, of course there's a linguistics which focuses on the politics of language, the discursive properties of language. 
and how meanings are created because in the end ultimately all that survives is that written or oral record but there is another way that you can do linguistics and that's the kind we do which is to think that every language that exists in each individual instantiates a specific type of human language a, a knowledge that actually has got nothing to do with nationalities nothing to do with nations nothing to do with groupings nothing to do with caste it's a specific domain specific knowledge which enables the human mind to express itself so in that so the loss of any one language is the loss of knowledge which a person has and if we are, if we stand here today in a university to what are we talking about of course we have a current crisis we'll win it no problem but we might have one such crisis but what do we want to leave behind we want to leave behind an academics and a legacy which says every language is equal every language whether you know the government gives it a grammar or not or whether it has a script not every language tells us something about what it is to be human so every human has human dignity and it is the upholding the greatest humanist tradition that the work of noam chomsky and many thousands of linguists uh, is interested in so in the same way the loss of any language is a loss of way for me to know so i don't go as ethnographic conqueror i go as a student i go to learn what they know so it's a tradition of humility and of dignity i will i guess i've done done too much so i'll just speak a little bit more when in this great university that we have just like this great nation with a capital n university with a capital small letter u <laughs> in this great university every year students come into our classroom into the linguistics department classroom speaking hindi english punjabi sometimes um uh, maybe they speak some bit malayalam they all speak languages with capital letters in their first time by the time we are done with them they are speaking bajika angika maghi tamang uh, tagin this we as if we are to be citizens and i would request everybody give a slogan in their own language as i finish if we are to be citizens and especially on this day but every day we must speak our languages and we must speak them with pride thank you oh so i'm being told by popular demand to tell you how i mean we should really not think of the senses as actually telling us anything about who we are um you know the definition of mother tongue uh in the indian census is one that um says that it's a very I and mean, it's a really deep definition so it says what's your mother tongue language spoken to you by your mother <laughs> it's a government it's a government definition there's an and or or it is so and what <laughs> so or a language spoken in the household if you are a deaf mute okay this is the definition in the that's the first and last time i think again in 60s they defined it now very interestingly one has to be really worried about the health of many communities so if the census is every 10 years and so i mean what is the reproductive possibilities that you can have remember it's a language spoken by your mother or the people around you if you are deaf mute between 1971 and 1981 the reporting for sanskrit grew by 6000% i think we have to feel really sorry for the women <laughs> and i would like now so today we've had a really very good day um watching a series of film on cultures that we should learn lessons from by the way no self respecting person from the north east comes back and says i speak manipuri they all come and say the names of the languages they actually speak so you will find many many languages in much much more variety today we've had the pleasure of watching six 
uh, films by Tarun Bhatia, who also kindly agreed to speak to us. These are films about uh, the so-called language and culture of the Northeast. And what we've come away with is this incredibly plural, beautiful, living culture, which does not get fixed, which escapes museums, which is of the people tied up with practice and constantly changing. Tarun has agreed to speak to us and also, and I don't know where he is. Questions? Questions that I can take, but maybe Tarun can speak for one.